Welcome to the Kyperian Commentary Podcast. This is episode 125, and I'm talking to uh, Boo Boo, who is uh, one of our uh, CRC pastors. He's actually a retired pastor in the CRC, but he's the presiding minister of Hoos Presbytery, which is our European uh, presbytery. He's on the board of the Joint Eastern European Project and has has done a lot of work uh, at bringing Reformation uh, to the churches over there. I wanted to talk to him today because at our CREC council meeting this last fall, he gave a talk on uh, the CREC and the world and the world perspective. And one of the things he talked about was an, an idea that I thought was interesting, which is pessimistic uh, post-millennialism. We hear about optimistic amillennialism. Uh, Boo Boo brought in the idea of pessimistic post-millennialism. Uh, Boo Boo, welcome to the podcast, and it's good to have you on. Uh, thank you for inviting me for the podcast. Just one correction. Uh, the Hus Presbytery embraces not only the European churches, but also Japan. And they would not like me to forget that. That's true. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> it's just since well, I'm going to visit them in two weeks, and they might be really angry with me not correcting you. Yes. So Japan as well. Um I wanted to to bring you on just to talk about this idea that you had. Uh, you were talking about um, about the idea that one of the most dangerous things uh, is optimism. Optimism can be a, a dangerous thing, and you were talking about. I'm trying to remember uh, the book you were talking about. I wrote it down, and now I've already already forgotten. I've got it on my to read list. Uh, who was the Who was the author? You were talking about the six uses of pessimism uh, the title is the uses of pessimism by roger scruton scruton that's right okay that was the one i was remembering uh and you were you were applying that a little bit to our our overall eschatology our view of the future tell me a little bit about why you think optimism is a potential danger for post-millennialists well first we need to define the terms right <laughs> as Jordan Peterson says often. And, you know, uh, preparing for the interview, I just checked an American dictionary, American English dictionary, and there are several definitions there, but one that's probably the most applicable to our uh, discussion is uh, that, you know, optimists anticipate the best outcome, the best possible outcome, and pessimists Anticipate, uh, anticipate the worst possible outcome, right? Right. So it's not just about uh, like, you know, pop optimism or everything will be fine. If not today, then tomorrow. Well, here in Europe, we say everything will be fine, but not for you, right? <laughs> so that's, right. We, we probably will talk more about how different nationalistic or nation groups approach the, the problem of uh, pessimism and optimism, but that's our general uh, attitude. So if you anticipate the, the best possible outcome, oh man, that's that's it. You're done, right? Because we know from uh, experience, personal experience, um, unless you're really like a young baby, right? But it's enough to be 20 to know that the best possible outcome is what we wish and hope for, but it almost never happens, right? right. If you anticipate the best possible outcome, uh, the outcome will be disastrous for you, right? And many people smarter than, than me uh, talked about this. For example, Nassim Taleb, best known from, from the Black Swan, right. but I think that the, probably his other books are better. So he, he writes in a book titled... Uh, anti-fragility, I think there's a title, that if you anticipate the best possible outcome, then basically that's it. The game is over because it never happens, the best possible outcome. That, that's why he talks a lot about uh, redundancy, like we need to have some savings on the bank account, right? Right. <laughs> Instead of hoping for the best possible outcome and buy a lottery ticket. Uh, and then uh, I checked the, the definition for pessimism, and this is quite actually quite interesting because it's not as pessimistic as many people uh, uh, think it is. Uh, so 
Pessimism is is an anticipation of the worst possible outcome. And you know, be with me here. Anticipation of the worst possible outcome. It doesn't mean that that the worst possible outcome will actually realize, but you anticipate it. So you you prepare for it, right? right. I'm, I'm I'm not sure if there are any preppers among the listeners or the watchers of, of, of the channel, but you know, maybe they go a little bit over the board. Uh, like, you know, the EMP might happen anytime. So this is why we need to we need to get completely off the grid or at least buy some wool socks, right? Because they are better than cotton socks. And but but if you anticipate the worst possible outcome, uh, it doesn't mean that that this is actually what will happen, but it means that well you, you get ready for what Nassim Taleb, for example, call, calls black swans. And so completely unexpected events that will happen sooner or later, I mean, either on a national or a denominational-wide scene or in your personal life, right? This is why you want to be a little bit prepared for whatever happens. Maybe right. you have a sack of potatoes in your basement just in case. If they go bad... Well, you lose, but if you cannot buy any food because of COVID or war or anything else, well, it's better to have some food stored in your basement. So there's a difference between optimism and pessimism, right? One uh, expects all the best, which never happens. Yeah. I mean, Jesus told us to expect all the best, but at the end of history, right? He promises us the fullness of the kingdom and all the good things, but he says, "Well, but that's at the beginning, uh, at, at 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 the end. Right? What happens in between? Well, we don't quite know. Right. And I think that's something that that you sometimes see among post millennialists is the idea that we're we want to bring. We do know that the nations will be discipled. We know that the nations will be." bowing the knee to Christ, but we want to bring that all forward to, it's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen next week. It's happening uh, right now. Um, does that leave us unprepared for for when times of trial or trouble actually do happen? I, I believe it does. You know, 25 years ago, as I became a post post I I was raised dispensational. So, uh, the expectation was that you know the the end of the world is just around the corner, uh, <clears throat> but you know when I became post millennial, I wanted to be optimistic, and that was that was in the mid nineties. You need to maybe, maybe I will explain a little bit, a little bit of the context. I was born and raised in the communist Poland, right? Right. Or Poland uh, occupied by by the communists on behalf of Moscow. Uh, so everything was pessimistic. Uh, we didn't expect much, especially since, uh, as I grew older, the economic situation and the political situation in the country became worse and worse and worse. And then everybody started uh, threatening us. We're talking about the, the uh, nuclear world war, and and the end. There was this movie about well. War. How how life will look like after a, a nuclear war? So that that was that was my context, how I grew up. So th the dream that we all shared was to escape this communist paradise, maybe to Germany, at least West the West Germany, not the East Germany, right. or you know America, if we we are lucky. And then uh, 89, we could say that it's the end of communism in Poland and in the region. Everybody becomes optimistic about the future. Soon we will join the EU. So soon we will join NATO. Soon everything will be better. And at the same time, the country opens uh, new people, new missionaries, new books flood into the country. Uh, that that's when I also became a Calvinist because before it was kind of well, nobody actually knew what Calvinism was except for uh, the fact that Calvin was a bad guy. Mm. And new churches 
started popping up like you know everywhere it was enough in poland ukraine and other countries it was enough to go to the uh, uh street row uh, no whatever to the street to the market old market in wrocław preach the gospel for 15 minutes and you could start a new church that that was the response like a small revival that's what everybody was dreaming about and it happened so mm. we became optimistic and with all the political changes we were hoping that oh it's enough to tell people the truth it's enough to <laughs> apply some quick fixes it's enough to uh, maybe elect one of our guys as a mayor of the city or gov governor of the region or the president of the country and you know like that before we die we'll see the paradise right fulfilled and uh, well we made a lot of mistakes because of that that optimism and mainly i think we made the mistakes that we made were the mistakes because we focused on different things we didn't prepare for the long run right right and there was a lot of talk and some political action. And of course, we got involved in homeschooling. Uh, I have nothing against homeschooling. I support homeschooling, especially in countries where, you know, the public schooling is as bad as in America or mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, but but then, you know, for us, these were like quick fixes, like band-aids, right? Mm -hmm. You apply it, you know, two, three, maybe four of them, and that's it. And we are there, but it never happened. And then we neglected other things that are more immediate, that were more immediate to us, something that we actually could influence, uh, something that we could change. You know, it's it's the, the typical Jordan Peterson, forgive me for mentioning him again, thing <laughs> like, you want to change the world? Where do you start? Make your bed. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but we forgot about our own bedrooms, mm. our little kingdoms, and we're dreaming about saving at least our country. Right. You know, I think there's something similar in um, maybe the, the early homeschooling movement in America. I think there was something similar to that where I, I don't know there was a, a realization of the, the long term commitment it was going to be. Uh, that was the time of the moral majority and, and Jerry Falwell. And I, I like Jerry Falwell. I went to his school, so I'm a fan. But uh, he, you know, th there was this idea that there's going to be a, a change and it's going to happen quickly. And it's turned out, you know, the, the gospel teaches you to raise faithful generations over time, children, grandchildren. Uh, what, what were some of the things you feel like um, were neglected? You said there were some things that you could have influenced that what were kind of left aside. Maybe not you personally, but just in general. Um, you know that you, you, you ask me to step on thin ice because maybe, maybe some people they, that, that I used to work with will, mm. will listen to this recording. Yeah. But, well, I, I think that... Okay. Okay. <laughs> The church, I mean, I talk, I'm talking about a local church, you know, this is our little garden of Eden, right, for right. everybody. And everybody knows that that I'm of Jim Jordan. So I, I would say, well, for me, it's like, it's not the family that's, that, that is the little garden of Eden. It's a local church that, that is our little garden of Eden. And of course, our, our families are, are part of it, right? So, right. Well, I would say, yes, think globally, you know, dream big, uh, never forget the kingdom of God, because this is what Jesus tells us in, in the Sermon of the Mount. But then he says, no, the kingdom, you never forget about the kingdom, because the kingdom actually draws you, it perpetuates you, it, it makes you move towards it. But as you mentioned, it's, it takes generations even like more than a few generations uh, because, well, the second commandment, right? God talks there about, well, depending on the translation, to a, to a thousand of generations, some say to thousands of generations. So how many generations has 
there have been since the creation of Adam, uh, 200. Right. That's really not much, right? I mean, there is still a long way to go. So, well, the little things that we can do is actually focus on the local church. I mean, I am all for being a part of some bigger ecclesiastical structures. This is why I advocated among our guys here in Poland and, and beyond Poland that you need to be a part of something bigger because just like for Adam, it wasn't good for him to be alone even though he had his personal God, uh, it's the same for local churches. But local ch a local church is actually what, what we can, where we can accomplish the most because this is a place where we basically learn to love our neighbor, like real life na neighbor, right. the person that sits next to me, right? And not some kind of a abstract Rusonian kind of neighbor that lives on the other side of the planet. It's so much easier to love these people, right? right. That we have never met. Uh, this is where you learn hospitality, for for example. And we actually, after a while, put a lot of uh, emphasis on, on hospitality, and then ra raising the kids. But not just by doing, you know, applying homeschooling as it would be like some magic. How do you say the word wand? Right. You just touch it, you know, say a few words, and and that that it and it works. Thank God we were not the first generation who who tried to apply this kind of approach, with different results, right? Uh, but like things like uh, ministry to the kids in the church. I know that some of the older folks said, no, 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 it's all up to to the families. Mm. Forgetting the families are actually parts of of local church. Right, and especially when it comes, and most of our churches are small churches uh, with few kids and few teenagers. Well, let, let's do something for them because these are the future generations. Uh, so I, I think that at the beginning we didn't we didn't put enough emphasis on uh, kids ministry and also on the youth ministry, <laughs> which right. yes, the responsibility of the parents. But I think that. Yeah. We as church should also minister to them, uh, maybe also maybe beyond the the regular Lord's service on the Sunday morning. Right. I I see that. Um, you've probably read Yuri's book, the the Church Friendly Family. Have you seen that? Maybe not. I, I I've seen the book. My reading list is pretty long. <laughs> yeah. Been, well, um, I know these are some you know, the, the idea no, there... I have not. I have not yet. Yeah, there's, um, you know, I, I guess the the idea in a lot of families, and it sounds like, you know, what you're saying is one of the things we can directly influence is our local church, the relationships we have with people there, uh, and how important that is. And I think you you see maybe two directions people go away from that, and one is the the very idea of like the family centered church, where your family is your little church. The father is like the priest of his family. And then the church is just there to minister to the father while he takes care of his family versus the family is part of the church. The children are part of the church. The church is the central thing that the family is attached to. Um, so that's one way it could go astray. And I think the other way is you see, especially in evangelicalism, the the pastors who see their local church as a stepping stone to the next big thing that they want to do with their career. So the book deal, the, the lecture circuit, the, the, the big glorious picture, you know, that you're after versus faithfulness in the small things. That kind of seems like I, the two directions. That, that's very important. That's actually crucial for, well, not only for our ministry, but also for every brother's life, right? Because, right. uh, well, life never goes the way we we expect it to, right. and we 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 better uh, make the best use of the things that we we can that are available to us. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't need to dream big. I, I would uh, say that I am a big dreamer, but you know it's it's the it's the perspective, right? Uh, mm. We can do something here and now with the big picture of the fullness of the kingdom in mind 
And this is actually what makes us minister and sufferer, right? This is what, in the New Testament, how many times Jesus and other apostles, well, after his crucifixion and resurrection, before, of course, before they were of a different mindset. Peter said, Lord, it will never come upon you, mm -hmm. right? But right. then when you read Paul and Peter, how many times they talk about, well, we need to share in the sufferings of Christ. We need to, uh, we must enter the kingdom through many afflictions, right? Right. Uh, this is what they experienced, and this is what we need to experience. And this, because of the afflictions are inevitable, and, you know, problems of this or that kind will, will uh, befall upon us sooner or later. This is why I think we need to well, grow strong. And uh, But we can grow strongly not only by dreaming about big, big things, but also by making our immediate uh, surroundings or neighborhood strong. Because... Uh, when something happens, when a black swan happens, this will be the most immediate or the easiest accessible resource or source of resources for us, the people around us, right? Good right. friends, good brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is something also that, that our people in Ukraine experience right now. Maybe earlier uh, joining the CRC was some kind of like, well, you know, it, it would be nice to get to know some of these American guys when we go and visit America from time to time. But now, you know, in in the time of afflictions and suffering, they they know. Oh, actually, it was so good that we invested in this close relationships with the real people because right now, thanks thanks to this, we we can actually survive the calamities that fell upon us. Right, and so you've in, certainly in, been in the involved end, I would in, say, you know, in that situation a lot, I think. Yeah, in the, in the end, I, I would say that it's the difference between like real-life relationships uh, and abstract intellectual life. Because in the end, uh, you know, optimistic post-millennialism, it, it's, it, it's an abstract intellectual game that, that we play, right? Right. Instead of uh, doing the ministry to the people next to us, and so uh, building and de them up, so that they, in in the time of affliction, they also can be the source of our strength. Right. Uh, so, the the key then in your mind is investing in those local close relationships and uh, making your bed. Fixing what was it Jordan Peterson says? Address the things that present themselves as needing attention, or so, something along those lines. I can't remember yes. the exact phrase, but look I, around I you and see yes. what you can do there. Yes, yes. But again, you know, it wasn't like you know the the mindset. Well, I grew up not only dispensational but also fundamentalist, so it was the the ghetto mindset. So we basically didn't care what happened outside of the world. No, right. we want to focus locally and grow strong, so mm -hmm. that we can eventually, Lord willing, you know, in, in influence the world outside of us. But if you want to, well, fix whatever is broken in the world. You know, first we need to be fixed. We need to be stronger. We need to uh, gain some uh, wisdom because without that, we might actually do more bad than than good. Uh, there is this. Uh, I think it's a Russian movie. It's about uh, well, there is some party, communist party, apparatchik meeting with workers, and she tries to explain to them why God doesn't exist. And then one of the guys raises his hand and, and asks, so, but by the way, do you know why uh, there are different poops that different animals make, like dog poop, cat poop, uh, cow poop? And of course, she's perplexed. She doesn't know where he's getting to with this and says, well, he says, well I'm not an expert in animal poop. You know, I'm here to talk with you about God. And the man says, well, if you know nothing about animal poop, how can you talk about God with us, right? <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes we 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 optimistic post millennials behave like this. We think that you know we can deal, 
we can fix all the big problems, right? The problem of LGBTQ, globalization, George Soros, and other things like this. But uh, actually, we know so little about the world, even less about the people, even less about how societies work. Uh, and the end, we want to apply some medicine to their problems. This, this is haughtiness. This is hybris, right? The, mm-hmm. This is what I think the uh, optimism leads to in the end. Right. So if you, um, I want to wrap up here in just a minute where we're running closely out of time, but we've got a few more minutes left. Um, if you want to address maybe the the internet post-millennialist community on social media uh, who want to change the world, fix the world, make it better. Um, what do you see going well, maybe in the CREC, but even more broadly in in the Christian community? And what do you see that could be focused on better? Uh, you know, right now, I mean, we've even got things like the war, the war in Ukraine. I mean, there are tons of opinions about that war and they're all opinions formed by people on the other side of the world who aren't there and and whose opinions don't really matter at all anyway because they're not affecting anything so um i guess i should say you know what 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 would you say to maybe the the chronically online post-millennialist who has a, an opinion on everything and and wants to fix everything today just kind of as a, a wrapping up final point I would say uh, spend less time on arguing over the internet on this or that technicality. Instead, maybe read the book of Job, maybe read the book of Ecclesiastes. They are thoroughly post-millennial, but they are pessimistically post-millennial, I would say. Because in the end, yes, of course, everything is fine. But in the meantime... And, and and this is where we minister. This this is our life, right? It's the meantime between now, between today, and the fullness of the kingdom. Uh, read the story of Joseph. Man, what happened to the poor man? He had the dream, right? I had a dream. Uh, the moon, the sun, the stars bowing down to him. Uh, you know, we can imagine what kind of life did the boy Im- imagined back then. And then uh, some things happened, right? Right. Uh, and we know what happened. In the end, yes, he was basically the chief of Egypt, but it wasn't easy. So I, I think that, well, the story of Abraham, it's the same. God tells him, just go and, you know, and I will give you the land that, that you have never visited and, and so on and so on. And the Bible says it took 400 years, right, <laughs> for the promise to be fulfilled so well first the perspective then i think even the the command go means you know go away from the screen i know we're recording this i'm not (laughs) anti-internet but but right i I see young people spending so much time in the internet that it basically uh makes them like fixed males you know what i mean right right uh th- this is a rossonian kind of post-millennialism where you care so much about the abstract neighbors abstract ideas big things but you just neglect real life and right. you know we are called to to live the real life here and now and then yeah I know. Uh, read the scatological uh, parts of the Bible about the promises and the future, but also read the parts of the Bible that actually present us the, the pattern or the path that we need to follow to actually get there. Remember about the the generations that 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 are needed. And you know, I read once a study that that uh, showed that. A positive change from generation to generation is on average just like 5%. Right. That's very little. And it also <laughs> should remind us that it is a long run. And, and you know, maybe not many things will 
will happen like we wish to. But there is one more thing that maybe I will wrap it up with. Uh, so Roger Scruton, we started with him. Right. Uh, he, he he criticizes what he calls the unscrupulous optimism, and then he talks about pessimism, uh, and you know not the darkest kind of pessimism. But but he says, well, the, the main difference is that the optimists they live in the world of abstract ideas. They believe in historical necessities. They they think that you know things will just happen. That life will get better from you know a year to year. Whereas the, the, the pessimists actually live real life in real world. They do not neglect, for example, the wisdom that, that has been gleaned by the pre, by previous generations. So we too, we don't want to ignore the wisdom of Rajduni, for example, or, or Jim Jordan. Uh, we shouldn't probably treat their writings as the holy scriptures, but right. you know, not neglecting the experience of the if you past generations uh, because they actually can teach us some, some wisdom. And this is like real life based wisdom, of course, interpreted by the Bible. But the, the other kind of post-millennialism, I think, is completely detached from reality. It just lives in the world of the ideas which actually does not exist as Nassim Taleb reminds us about all right. Well, thank you once again for being here, uh, Boo Boo. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to include a link to the council talk here so you can go watch that as well if you'd like.